Welcome to Decision, Decision Space, Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns of your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. In today's episode, we're docking the interdecisional spaceship at Space Base and helming a fleet of ships powered by the undeniably fun energy generated by the clattering of dice. We'll discuss probability, strategic diversity, timing puzzles, and dance around the core question of, are there interesting decisions in space space? And does it even matter? So it's going to be a really awesome episode. I think that Space Space Jake is sort of a game that I've known about for a long time, but didn't think I'd ever play. Like I saw it and I was sort of like, that's cool. I'm really glad it exists, but I don't think it's for me. And now I think that might be wrong. I think this might be a game for me. Yeah, no, it's uh, totally. I feel the same way. Let's see. Space Space is a few years old now. Uh, came out in, what, 2018, it looks like. Yep. And I, I distinctly remember it coming out and generating a lot of buzz at that time. And uh, I kind of remember like looking at it and thought, okay, that seems cool. It's like cool Machi Koro, but I don't really like Machi Koro. So I'm not, wasn't that interested in seeking it out. And I wonder if that might be something that you've shared and that other people have shared too. So I think it'll be cool to dive into that question in this episode uh, to see if people are maybe wrongfully or rightfully overlooking this game. Yeah, I think that that will make a really interesting comparison on the back end. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on on that comparison. I feel like in some ways, Space Space is like mired in the comparison to Machi Koro. Like anytime someone talks about Space Space, Machi Koro comes up somehow. And maybe it's not justifiable. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of like games that are similar to other games. You know, you've got a lot of games in the worker placement space and the deck building space that are like similar. But I mean, this game feels like a re-implementation almost. You Interesting. Know? Yeah, yeah. And it takes a pretty core piece. Uh, I yeah, hear you. yeah. Should we just get into our ratings and slogans right off the bat? Sure, let's do it. Am I going first? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare yourself. Okay. Okay, sitting down to play Space Space, I do feel a bit like a commander of a fleet of ships, Jake. The mimetic quality of the game's visual metaphor really works for me. Like, I feel like I'm at a command console and I have all these different ships potentially firing. And as an engine builder, Space Space is fraught with all the right tensions. When you convert your engine into points... Should I shut down a valuable lane to earn this chunky windfall of points now? Will that be worth it? Is it better to keep ramping up or just punch it? All those questions are here, and they're the beating heart of what I think makes Space Space fun. But for a fleet commander, I shouldn't always feel like I have the agency I wish I had. And sometimes the game's clever dice mixing mechanism doesn't offer the compelling decisions that I wish it would. And Space Base is a really fun romp, but it's just flat out too long. Uh, I enjoy my plays for the swashbuckling highs, despite never feeling quite as clever as I wish I would play it. Because when I do clever things, they often don't come to fruition because of the way the randomness works out. So for me, it's a solid 7.5 out of 10, but I really do enjoy this game. Awesome. I think I'm a bit lower than you on it. For me, I think Space Base is just a solid 6 out of 10. Uh, and since we haven't said in a while, typically I'm going off the board game geek rating scale. So a 6 is an okay game, some fun or challenge at least, will play sporadically in the if in the right mood. And that kind of hits it square on the head for me. I think after playing Space Base, a few times, not as much as I would have liked, um, or to be uh, totally frank with our audience, not as much as a lot of the games that we do cover on this show. So then we're kind of squeezing this episode in. There might be more fluctuation in this rating than past ratings I've done if I were to go back at it. But I think after the experiences I've had so far with Space Space, it's a game I'm excited to show other people mm. more than I'm excited to play myself i think it's like a game that is a really cool and fun gateway game i think it's a perfect game to introduce to somebody after they have experienced settlers of Catan. because in a lot of ways i think this game and the machi koro style of game basically just strips out the fun dice part of Catan and makes it you know accessible and engaging and kind of leaves off a lot of the stuff that makes Catan too long playing for what i want so I think like there's a ton of value in that. But at the same time, I think your criticisms ring very true for me. It's a little too long. I wish this game just played to like 30 points maybe instead of 
40, I think that would be much more of like a sweet spot that would make me want to like fire it up and play again. And the other thing is playing this game on Board Game Arena. It's not something I noticed as much when I was playing asynchronously in our plays, um, because then I'm only getting notified when I have a decision to make. But <laughs> when I played this game live, uh, you, you're able to set these two sort of filters that tell you like only, you know, like just auto select if there's a clearly better choice when when you're like activating your your space bases on your turn which brendan is going to explain the rules overview kind of how that works if you're unfamiliar but basically you can choose to just like auto select the best option and i was kind of shocked playing it live like how much i'm just sitting there and like the game is like literally playing for me it was just like such a clear distillation of like wow you really don't have that many choices to make at all in this game and the ones you do i mean they're going to be totally dependent upon luck of the roll. So I think that that was just a couple of issues that keep it from being like a game that I just want to say like unequivocally is a good game. Um, but yeah, that that's sort of my synopsis review in short. I think that now is probably the best time to talk about the dice mixing mechanism because you just invoked it. And I feel like that is the biggest curveball of this game because it presents itself as this really interesting decision, right? Like you can do this or you can do this functionally that just doesn't happen very often because it is there are strictly better options and i think the game ends up in this weird zone where it either is so lightweight that it's actually just like a outcome optimization mechanism which is what it really is it's just like roll these things and then you get the best possible outcome but if it was a heavier game maybe that mechanism could have created more choices but to create that you would have needed more resources and just different things on the cards to make going for this versus that matter more and because you're only ever picking between victory points or money or sometimes income but typically not it's just there's not that much to decide about. Right. And most often your choice will be something like, do I want three money or two money? It's like, yeah. I guess I'll take three money. <laughs> yep, <laughs> you know? exactly. And the most interesting it gets is, do I want three money or two victory points? Right. And it, it, sometimes that's interesting. It can be interesting, but, you know, and this is getting probably too much into the discussion of the game. But since you say that now, like that's a decision you make exactly one time. Like yeah. once you've chosen victory points. Like you should you just probably keep be doing choosing it. victory points every time for the rest of the game. Yeah. Just based on how engine building games like this work. Totally. Yeah. Well, we've kind of like due to my jumping in because it felt like the right moment. We're, <laughs> we're, we're jumbling up the episode. We've got our ships backwards. But Jake mentioned earlier, this game was published in 2018 by AEG and it's designed by John D. Clare. And John D. Clare is basically, uh, I think it has this lasting design partnership with AEG. And you might know John D. Clare for some of his other games, like Mystic Veil, vale, which is a card game that comes with sleeves. And you basically, throughout the course of play, get to augment cards. So the cards in your deck of a certain type might be, uh, your opponent might have those cards, but over the course of play, your version of that card becomes unique by slotting different effects on top of that card. Um, Cubito, Cubitos came out in 2021. That's a race game that was pretty well received. And then Dead Reckoning just came out in 2022. These are all John D. Clare games, and they're all from AEG. And I think that I sort of stuck on Mystic Veil vale there, Jake, because I wanted to highlight the point that I think that augmentability is really a trademark of what John D. Clare is doing in his design. And I think Space Base doesn't, it, people don't talk about enough how this is really about augmenting outcomes and that that's part of the fun of this design is that when a three gets rolled for me, that could mean something vastly different than when a three gets rolled for you. Totally. So should we also mention two? just jump in to say for our pre planners who play games along with us before we go too far ahead, uh, upcoming games we'll be covering on this show in some non-specific order include Isle of Cats, Living Forest, Agricola, <laughs> blood rage uh, and and those are just the ones that were sort of in the queue right now so i'm not really sure we have a clear idea of like what order those games are going to be covered in but i think those are games we're kind of committed to covering all of them at some point in sort of the next phase of this show maybe something else will come in that we'll talk about uh in in between there if something really excites us too but we just wanted to let you all know uh, who, who follow along this show, if you want to kind of engage with us in our Discord, we'll be playing and talking about those games, or just if you want to explore them on your own to get more out of the episodes as they come up. 
uh, yeah, those those are the ones that are on our agenda. And for a lightning, a light speed update, Jake and I are playing Bonfire. He he has me back on Bonfire playing a Steffenfeld game with him. I like Steffenfeld. I just bounce off Bonfire. So for listeners of the show, we are playing that game. We'll probably talk about it at some point if we can light enough bonfires in my heart. And I guess kind of while we're doing this disjointed update, uh, yeah, last, what the heck? Thing, <laughs> last thing I wanted to say is uh, hopefully um, you've noticed an uptick in our audio quality. I'm recording uh, with a brand new microphone and I just want to say um, thank you again to our Patreon supporters who kind of made that possible. So what I got is a Rode pod mic. I got a Motu M2 audio input thing. So I'm off of USB mics for now. Um, and yeah, hopefully it's making a noticeable impact and improving the quality of the show because that's really the whole point of starting the Patreon. So it's just really cool to see that come to fruition. And a big thank you to all the members of the crew, our Patreon supporters who made that upgrade possible. All right. Uh, well, Brendan, should we jump into your rules overview uh, recorded separately and then we'll kind of get back into this, you know, kind of crank it back into into orbit here as we get back into the discussion of this game Space Base. Let's do it. Space Space is an engine building race game for two to five players with a novel mechanism. Each player has a tableau in front of them showing cards corresponding to values 1 through 12. At the start of each player's turn, they roll two six-sided dice. Then they have a decision. They can take the values corresponding to each of the dice. For example, if a 3 and a 5 are rolled, they could activate both the 3 and 5 value slots on their tableau, or they could combine them and activate their 8 value slot. Each card has two potential payouts, a blue payout, activated when it's your turn, or a red payout, activated when it's another player's turn. Blue payouts are typically more lucrative, but red payouts can be stacked by purchasing additional cards of the same value. For example, when a player purchases a 3 value card, they tuck their previous 3 value top card under the old one such that it shows all red payouts underneath it. So over time, players build large, lucrative stacks of red payouts in certain values if they purchase multiple cards of that same value. Cards in the game produce a variety of effects. Some generate credits used to purchase additional cards. Others increase income. At the end of a player's turn, if they have fewer credits than income, they gain credits equal to the difference. So if a player has 10 income and 2 credits at the end of their turn, then they gain 8 credits. Others generate points, and still others have various effects, allowing a player to manipulate die rolls, or activate the payouts of adjacent cards, or gain cards without paying the cost. Each turn is relatively simple. The active player rolls the two dice, then everyone resolves the corresponding effects on their own tableau. Then the active player can use credits to purchase a new card for their tableau from a face-up display of three card rows, or they may purchase a colony card. Colony cards provide immediate points at the expense of shutting down part of a player's engine. There's just one for each value in the game, so there's real tension over when to take these both because of the cost to one's engine efficiency, but also the potential to lose the opportunity to purchase them if someone else gets to them first. Play continues with players building their engines and tableaus until a player reaches 40 or more points, then everyone gets one additional turn up to the whomever was the start player such that every player in the game has an equal number of turns, at which point the player with the most points is crowned the victor. Welcome back interdecisional spaceship travelers. We are now uh, docked at the space base and we are ready to get into the main portion of this episode where we characterize the decision space in this game and maybe in keeping with our last episode we should talk a little bit about the size and depth of this game yeah i don't think it's very big decision space. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm not convinced it's a very deep one but it is a really fun one yeah how's okay. that for a take jake oh, whew. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm like fanning myself over here because that was that's a hot take. No, I mean, you know, it's hard to disagree with that. I think like when you think about the objective size of decision space, right? Like there aren't really, you know, what we talked about, like branching factor. And this game has like 
none of that really in a sense because like each branch is so contingent upon like rolls of the dice so you could say for example i want to buy this card that goes into my 10 slot that if it's rolled i'm going to get six gold and if if i get that six gold then i'll have you know likely i'll have 12 on my next turn so that i could buy this card that costs 12 but of course like that is completely contingent upon you rolling a 10, which is a lot less likely to happen than it is likely to happen. So it's sort of like, you know, in in that sense, like, you know, I don't think the sort of branching decision space where you're thinking like several turns or moves ahead here kind of happens at all, uh, which is interesting because it might be the only game that we've covered on this show uh, without really that ability to think very far into the future. Yeah, I, I'm conflicted here because I think the branching factor of this game is marginally high, but I think that the like impactful branching factor is pretty low. And I don't really know clearly what I mean by that, but I think that in other games, you, you can think clearly about the consequences of each decision and the branch that you go down. And like you're saying, Jake, here, you're sort of like, this is a good card, I'm going to buy it, but I can't plan based on having it. Because the 10 has to be rolled for it to come out on my turn. A 10 has to be rolled on my turn, not anyone's turn, to get the payout for it, right? Or I can buy two more 10s and then build it up and then maybe get a smaller payout on your turn. So it's like such a marginal, every every step, every decision you make is this like tiny step forward towards the end of the game. Like in a lot of race games, you feel like, oh, I'm really sprinting now. And in this game, you're like, I really power walk to that finish line, you know, uh, except for maybe you buy a couple of the the colony cards that really blast you ahead. But for the most part, we're, we're making like tiny little fine tuning adjustments over the course of this long game. And there is this inflection point where you look down and you're like, wow, I've really built something like I really do have a fleet of ships here. But it's a it's a, a plotting trip to that point. Yeah, I think the other thing, too, that makes the branching factor less, I guess, one is that on your turn, you're only doing one thing ever. So like there in lies, uh, well, I guess sometimes you have, in some scenarios, you might have something to activate, right? You could have like some cards have special powers where if like you've charged up, you could choose to use that card to increase the, the value the of a die value of a single die. So in that case, you sort of have like, I could do this and then I could increase this, which would provide these two options or I could increase the other die which could provide these two options or you know I could have either of these combined things so I guess you know in that sense there there is like a little bit of branching that can happen but it's pretty rare and, and I think much more often on your turn you just have one single choice which is like I'll buy one thing uh, or I'll get or I'll pass yeah um, and the other so and that is limiting of course because when you buy like only one thing, it the game has this like interesting income mechanic where no matter how much money you have, you have to spend it all to purchase anything. So if you have like eleven gold and want to buy something that costs four, you still spend all of your money and reset to zero rather than like having some left over. Are you you're confused, Brendan? Is that true? That's true. Really? Yeah. I mean, and then that's why you can never buy like two things on your turn yeah 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 yeah, and that's why the income works the way it does which is kind of interesting i really like the income mechanism here are you looking at the rules i am should i wait well we should probably cut this part but if you buy a card you must spend all of your credits how did i not know this jake i played this game like 15 times wow i think it's something that could be easily missed it took me like until my like second play to realize like what the heck's going on like i should yeah. have like like my money's not adding up here yeah uh, but the reason i think it could be easily missed is like generally a game like this is going to incentivize you to spend all, as much of your money as you can when yep. you're choosing to purchase anyway because you know the game is balanced around better cards costing more yeah so generally you're wanting it close to to zero and also the way the income works which is that you go up to your in you don't get income at the beginning of your turn you get at the end of your turn and go up to whatever income you have also incentivizes spending as much of your money as you can so not knowing that i think doesn't like actually change impact the play of the game as much as you might think yeah it would 
But but yeah, that's definitely something I think that reduces the possible like long-term planning because you can't say like, oh, I'll buy this cheap thing now and next turn I know I'll have this much money to try and buy this other thing that goes with my plan. It's like, no, you're start if you want to build something buy something expensive, you're always starting at square one, essentially. But I think you're forced into a more interesting decision there because then it's making part of the cost of the more expensive cards, not adding other cards to your tableau, which rather than like, okay, I'm just going to munch up all of these level row one cards that are really cheap and stack them up in my pursuit of a higher value card and causing a lot of card row turnover, making giving players less access to things that they see, making planning around purchasing a little harder you really get forced in that tougher decision of do I want to just not buy anything or do I want to buy a low value card? So I actually, I think that's a really novel, interesting mechanism. And it like takes away counting, just like it speeds it up. I like it too. Yeah. But I do think it like necessitates like a smaller decision space size. Sure, totally. So, but what do you think of, but I think like, so to me, the size decision space is objectively small because you just have you'll only be able to buy a certain number of things on your turn and only a certain number of those, a smaller subsection of those will make sense to buy. Cause if you have like 15 gold, even if that means you can buy any of the cards, like you're probably not going to be served in most cases to buy a row one card. Yeah. Just cause the impact of them is going to be a lot smaller and it costs all your money to do it. So it like does to me shrinks the size of the decision space a bit, but I think depth is where, this game might kind of like punch above its weight mm. actually. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I think there are like two primary modes of playing this game. I'm curious, Brenda, did you explore at all the mode where you get to like select your starting bases at all? Or did you only play where you just randomly get one starting base? I played both. Yeah. So I think like in that first decision of the game, uh, you have like, you get dealt, I, I don't know what the exact number is, but maybe something like six or eight possible cards that you yep. can add to your base. And you have like 15 or 20 gold to spend on them. And I think like there in the, you can create there. That is a very complex and deep decisions base, right? Because n- now you have a ton of options. Like, yeah. And you want to you want to look at what of those things make sense to buy. Do you want to just spend all your money now, or are you going to like look at the board and see that there's a particularly impactful card that you're going to like leave, you know, eight or twelve of your money available so that you can scoop that up on your first turn. Yep. Um, and I think like therein, like at the only opportunity of the game where you have the chance to make a ton of decisions at once, you can really do a lot to shape your long-term strategy in this game so much more so than you can do on any given turn. So I think like there's a ton of space in that particular starting setup for like good players to separate themselves from uh, novice and inexperienced players like me. And I noticed that frequently by just getting smashed in this game when I was playing against, you know, higher ELO players. And I, I have to imagine that like a lot of that separation was making better decisions for them at that point in the game i think that to your point jake about it punching above its weight class in terms of depth i think that you're onto something because i've also noticed that there's and feel like there's real strategic diversity in how you can approach building your tableau in in an interesting way like the more i play this game the more i see and think of different ways to try to arrange my cards and some of that's limited by the fact that the cards are random and just in rows and you can't always get access to what you need and it does a little bit have that classic engine builder type of decision space where it waxes a little bit at the start as you build up your engine and get access to more resources to buy more cards and then wanes pretty quickly when you start running your engine like jake said and your decisions start to feel really forced so even though you might have access to more things your actual viable decisions are smaller in number because you're just trying to get to 40 the fastest I think that those early decisions are really meaningful and do feel really impactful, which makes sense too, because your early decisions are going to have the most potential roles being fed into them in terms of them paying out. So you have more certainty that cards you buy earlier 
will create value for you than you do cards given to you later in the game. The closer you are to the end of the game, the less certain you are of a card purchase paying out for you. Outside of the colony cards, which creates, uh, which give you those immediate points, but shut off part of your, the, a blue part of your engine, which I think creates this really interesting tension and sort of smartly emphasizes the, that inflection point of all engine building games. And I love that. I think it's awesome. I think that maybe we can talk about the strategic diversity some there, Jake. Or maybe we haven't moved on from characterizing the decision space yet, because one thing we didn't, and then we could talk about that, is clarity. Um, right. we, we haven't, and I sort of hinted at it there. Yeah, I think that is important to touch on, especially as we kind of get into these, the strategic diversity of the game, like different paths you can go on. Yeah. Because I think like this game does have a very unique decision space feel and clarity uh, compared to any other game we've played before. And that is because like this game is so based on randomness of the role. You know, like any strategy that you choose to take, and there there are some strategies, you know, that are going to be like you can play the odds um, in a really interesting way, but like it's still going to be contingent upon dice roll uh, playing out. And I think like just like having that randomness as such a core element to be considering the decision space is something that's like worthy of consideration. I think so too. And the fact that, so you have this like probability curve because of the dice where you know that the most likely outcome is seven. Just that's something that we know about having two dice. But the, I think the twist here of being able to add the values together and get greater payouts, like the, the probabilities are known, but the payouts aren't necessarily completely uh, like the 12 pays out. So, so high, so, so much. And you know, you could get access to your four value a lot, but I think another thing that adds to some of the lack of clarity is it's hard to necessarily equate like how much is this 12 value card going to be worth it compared to this four? Like I don't have an easy way, even right. having a rough idea of the probability to know what the value will be, both just strictly because I don't know how many, how often either are going to be rolled, even if I think some of them are more likely or even if I know some of them are more likely than others to be rolled. And I think that that makes the purchasing decisions really interesting and creates this tension around, do I just double down on the cards I've already purchased and find a way to revalue my dice to push those outcomes and create those situations more often? Um, we can talk about whether certain strategies have worked for us or not within this game later. Um, or do I just try to spread out a bunch and make it such that whenever anything gets rolled, I'll get a little bit of piece of the pie and that's fine. Um, and it, it, it's sort of, I like that that tension is there, that it, it says like, do what you want. You have the agency so long as the cards appear in the row to make the decisions that you want. You want to stack up one few loon, go for it. And sometimes that can work, right? If, if the ones get hot, you can get a bunch of money and get a nice early lead. And I think that that for me is part of the fun. And it also liberates you a little bit from thinking too much about some yeah. of the card purchasing decisions because you can't know. Right. And I think that can be like, uh, a blessing and a curse because like it also you could sort of play this game and just sort of like throw your hands in the air like well like i don't know like it, <laughs> either i'm gonna roll an 11 or not but yeah if i roll an 11 it's gonna be really cool so yeah. i'm just gonna like take this card so i think like that is like an interesting thing and just to like draw the comparison one more time to settlers of Catan, which i think is uh gonna be a great like point of comparison to this game and like Machi Core style games, like in Settlers of Catan, like a 12 is strictly worse than a seven or not. I guess you can't get a seven and uh, Settlers sure. of Catan, but like the six or the eight, right? It's strictly worse because it's just going to be rolled less. And yet the payout is exactly the same. But here, of course, that's flipped on its head, as you point out, because the payout for getting a 12 is going to be Huge. greater on yeah. every single card in the deck than the six or the eight and then also the fact that like the math the probability math is also changed by the fact that like you can act you don't have to use the combined values you can use the two dice separately which yeah. makes all the values between one and six a lot more likely to be utilized and the interesting thing there too is like even by mid to late game a 12 might still be horrible for me but it might be really great for you which doesn't really change anything about the decisions per se except the decisions we made to put ourselves in that position. But I think 
it gives the game interesting texture. When yeah. we're sitting at a table and you have your 12 loaded up, it gets rolled. I know you're about to blast off. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Why did I invest so heavily in these sevens that no one's rolling? And I think like now probably makes sense to move into strategic diversity. But I think ultimately like that is the biggest strength of this game is that the game doesn't because when you take like one of the strategies you can use to great effect in this game, which is uh, going for like jackpots, like trying to load up on 10s, 11, 12, so that like if those get rolled just even once, you're going to like shoot off ahead of your opponents uh, because you're just generating just like such a tremendous amount of income early in the game uh, that all of a sudden now you can, you know, you're you're just like, ahead of everyone else on the type of cards you're able to buy. Um, it's impossible to say like when you make that first choice of taking a 12, if that's the right choice, because it's going to a hundred percent be dependent upon whether or not that number is rolled later in the game. Sure. But it doesn't matter because the game is just like giving you the opportunity to say like, I'm just going to do what's fun. And I think like, that is a stumbling block for a lot of other games, right? Where you hear a lot of criticism of like, well, what's like fun isn't what's good in this game. Like, mm-hmm. and I think like because of the random nature of this game, like the strategies are all, like are kind of all lifted to somewhat viability just because, yeah, sometimes you're going to roll a 12 and then it works out. Sure. Yeah, you have the excuse to go for the the fun jackpot strategy, even if, if you know it. You might, if that's what you want to do, even though it might not be the most winning, a little bit. I I totally agree because you're going to have that that high point game. I'm really curious, Jake. Did you mostly play this game at two players, or what player count did you play? And then what's like the the strategic path that you took? Like, what was the first things you tried, and what did you kind of like try in the middle? And then what have you decided is maybe like the best thing to be doing? Yeah. Um. So I played it. I think at two three and four yeah uh, i think i only played it at two like just in our games that we played together sure uh, and i do think it's an interesting question because i think the different like viable strategies probably change a bit uh just because having three rolls between your turn yeah is a lot different than having one so like i think that just like strictly makes going wide more advantageous in a higher player count game uh, because when you go wide that would be like picking up lots of different cards for different areas that's going to like activate more passive income between turns but i guess maybe i'm just thinking about that wrong because then it also if you go tall you have more chances of hitting it between turns so i don't really know but yeah i feel like i feel like there's definitely some different strategic considerations just based on the number of players i think like the strategies that i've gone on is sort of like at first i just tried to do like whatever seemed like i just tried to play like a super straight up engine builder where Mm. i just like went for income early and then at a certain point just started buying all the ones that generated points instead of income yeah i think that was my best performing strategy overall sure (laughs) but then as i played the game more like okay well i want to explore some other stuff uh, and and then I sort of tried to go more for like the ships that allow for like you to uh, like manipulate die results, like change around your bases. Like there's a card that allows you to like switch like all your five bases and eight bases or something like that. And I was, I was like really tried to get those strategies to work. Like okay, so this like will enable me to like get a bunch of you know strong bases into the five slot which is like much more likely to be rolled and i could even activate it like twice on my turn potentially uh and i do have to say like the strategies i tried to employ around the special power cards not very successful overall i so i had a pretty similar experience i played a lot more two-player games and i've also played it at four and three i had most of my success with pretty like typical just go for income or like just go for credits and then convert to points at some point i had decent success with trying to build up a ton of income in a few games i feel like you're making this decision early on jake where you're either gonna go for income or you're not like the seven through 12 slots have income payouts early on and either you're like going to be adding more income payouts and you're going to pursue that line Or you're going to cover them up and you're going to forget about it and you're just going to take credits. So that's another like example of a decision point that like is impactful and then goes away. Um, And then I 
also sort of moved into trying like, okay, I'm just going to go for high values in this game and I'll really stack up my, my seven through 12 slots or I'll mostly go for low values and stack those up. We're fine. Not, neither was great. And then I, the, the way I most enjoy this game is trying to create like a payout machine, right? Where you like stack up one of the slots that's higher, maybe like 11. And then you have a few of your lower cards, like your four and five are the ones that allow you to boost dice on when you trigger an effect. And then you have a bunch of arrows pointing to trigger the blue slots of your 11 slots. So you just like are trying to set up these chains where you're pumping yourself with points off some huge payout blue card. Typically didn't work. I felt like whenever I built up my reds and had red uh, red slots that were pointing towards activating other red slots at, as well, um, especially getting points into red slots, that seemed to be the games that I did the best in. But the yeah. games I had the most fun in were like creating this wacky machine of ships um, and trying to see if it would work. Definitely. And I do think like um, the like high value style of play, like they, they can that kind of like fits together with like the jackpot style, right? Where yeah. you like start out early on, like taking instead of building up the lower value stuff, you're building up like higher value stuff. And then you're like, well, now I have all this stuff. So I might as well like take this, take other spaces uh, that make it more likely that I'll hit them. Yeah. You know, so I think some of these strategies aren't like inherently separate, but can kind of like flow into each other. Um, and, and that's sort of like, I think a way the way this game plays out, right? Um, as soon as you have uh, different strategies coming like to the surface, it makes each decision on your turn a lot more clear and obvious. Yeah, but I think that some of the joy of this game too is that because there's a lot to like dislike about card rows, and I think that in general they're not the most exciting mechanism. But one real advantage of them here is that every game of space base, your your whole fleet looks different just by mm-hmm. the fact that the cards come out differently and you have to solve a different problem each time based on the cards that come out and reevaluate from your tactical position what the best card is to buy. And I think for me, those are the most fun decisions in space space is it's looking at that card row and saying, do I want to buy a card? OK, I want to buy a card. What card do I want to buy? And I'm also looking at my opponent's tableaus the most at that point in time, trying to just see what they might want to be doing. I'm not doing that a ton. It's something I wish I was doing a little bit more, but it does come into play some. And I think the purchasing decisions can feel really interesting because of the commitment that you're talking about, Jake. Like Once you commit to a strategic path, you're executing it. But in the decision point where you're trying to decide, like, okay, what am I doing? What am I going to go for based on the cards that are out here? Do I have momentum towards that strategy? That decision's really fun. And then you kind of just do it. And it's fun to just sometimes just, just do something to execute, yeah. right? We're not always executing in games. And I think executing a plan does feel fun when it works. But I think like too, just to like hit the nail on his head with like all of these strategies, you're kind of like determining it early on, right? Yeah. Yep. And then you're just having it like, and then once you're in one, it's sort of like just, it just kind of plays out. Like, yep. I think the the feeling I get with strategy in this game is almost like something akin to like an auto battler video game mm. where you're sort of like choosing your path and then, you know, all the roles are happening around the table and it's just like your strategy what that you've implemented is like it's either happening and it's popping off or it's not. And yep. that's like largely out of your control. It's just a result of the die. I think that that's really fair. I also, I think that us wanting it to be shorter is we want the inflection point of when you should change your engine from creating momentum towards building the engine itself towards creating points for you to be closer to that point of strategic commitment. I think if it, sometimes it feels like there's a pretty wide gap. And I think if if that point of strategic commitment was a little bit closer to when you should turn your engine on to pumping out points for you, spaceship points, uh, the game would flow a little bit better. It can get stymied in the execution phase. And look, I'm all for feeling like an admiral, but I don't want to feel like a, I'm stuck in a bureaucracy, right? right? I want to feel like I'm doing exciting things. And yeah, you, there's yeah. a fine balance there. Totally. And like, you know, I, I think I said it at the beginning, like the first choice of like determining that strategy, especially in the first, like when you get to like sort of pick from a large display of cards is super interesting. Yeah. Um, 
and then I just kind of want to know what's going to happen. And then, yeah. you know, and it's like really pretty like funny playing this game on board game arena live. It's like, it's only going to take like what 15, 20 minutes if people yeah. are like paying attention and it's going quickly, but like you, you know, you get like six decisions or something in the course of that, like 20 minutes. And it's still kind of fun. Cause I'm like, I set this thing in motion and now I'm like watching what's happening. And I feel like there is actual strategic depth in that, but it's like, like almost devoid of tactics. Yeah. And the slog of having to execute turns where you're not, where you're just a robot is right. a slog, especially in the, the middle, the, the, like the second third of the game is where it really bogs down for me. There's a lot of excitement and there's interesting decisions with buying colony cards and just trying to make the end of the game work for you. And there's a lot of excitement in the first third of building out your tableau and committing to the strategic strategic pass. But that middle third, if it could just be less than a third, it'd be yeah. such a better game. And obviously the whole game card design is balanced to 40 points so it wouldn't work to you'd just have to say, change all the cards you'd have to change everything to make yep. it like a 30 point game yeah but i think like the difference between this as a 20 minute game to play online and this as like a 10 or 12 minute game like for the type of decision space offered like i i want that like eight to 12 minute time slot is yeah. would just to me be like a much, much better fit. And I think like that is also a lot more analogous to like that sort of like auto battler video game genre too, right? That you feel it, it can run a little bit long sometimes. It's been a while since I've really tried one, but like that in my head, like playing like the Hearthstone Battlegrounds or whatever. Sure. It, it was like quick 10 10 minutes 10 minutes yeah yeah because of the high randomness and variability you want a game that iterates quickly so you can get back to making those interesting decisions early on where you're building out your your board of of characters or in space base your ships those are the good decisions and, and those games do work the same right where you like sort of pick a path to go down and now yep. you're like just picking the cards that fit into that path and i think you're doing the same thing here I think so too. There there are times where you make strategic pivots in space space because the cards that you needed to come out just aren't coming out. If you're like, okay, in this game, I'm going early. I'm trying to pivot into points early and I'm just going to get lots of cards that have points on them and I'm going to hope that I can get over the finish line first. And then if all of a sudden all the points cards dry up and there's just nothing you can add to your board, you're forced to pivot. Just like sometimes in those games, you can be going down a strategic path and then all of a sudden, all your stuff gets outclassed, at least the ones I've played, and you have to pivot into some new strategy, and you see if that works. But oftentimes, those decisions are so forced and obvious that they're not that interesting. Right. It's like you're buying all the points cards unless there aren't any points cards. And right. It's like, well, okay, now that's not really a choice. <laughs> you yeah, I've been it's forced really a decision. to do this other thing. And then what's your favorite card that you've played with, Jake? I, For me, I think it's the one, there's a card in the game that lets you, uh, it's like an activation. And when you use it, you just get to get a tier three and a tier one card for free. And I think that that feels like a really powerful dynamic turn where I'm making a lot of decisions, building out my tableau a bunch um, and getting that early can just feel awesome. Like all of a sudden, I don't care about needing as many credits i just care about activating that card over and over again and bl- ballooning my sh- my fleet you know i think that maybe that question like highlights sort of one of the weaknesses of the game which yeah. is that like i feel like i've gotten cool cards in games and then like never really got to like <laughs> activate them and like yeah. see them to the full their full potential and i mean and that probably speaks to the fact that you know i haven't played this game like that many times um but you know like I've tried a couple of times to get the cards that allow you to like swap different ports. Yeah. To work. So cool. It seems like awesome. And I'm like, okay, that's like a whole new strategic like possibility. But then like, as I've played out those particular games, like I've just found that like the cards that I want to, that means like now I need to buy cards that go into these two slots yeah. or especially like the higher value slot. And they just like weren't coming up. Or, you know, a different game I tried for and I like just wasn't rolling those die values. So it's like, yeah, I think that's cool as like a possibility in the game. Um, And but like, it's just different versus like other games where you'd ask like, what's your like favorite card where it's it's a lot easier to answer because I've like you get the card and you're for sure get to like experience how that like impacts the game where you just don't have that same kind of guarantee here. 
Totally. I think one of the things about Space Base and the cards that you just said is that that card, to our like strategic card brain, playing brains, like swap your 11 and your four slots. Great. I see this card. I'm like, this is a build around card. I know exactly what to do. But functionally, it's not really. It's a payoff card that says, if you have a bunch of 11s, buy this card and then use it and you're going to do great. Right. But it feels right. like a build around. So then I feel like I got got by the game for like leaning into this thing. But really, I'm not supposed to buy it until I could already use it. And that's just like frustrating. Like that type of card wants other cards that let you just instead of just swapping, like move cards one slot to the right or one or it, you would never want to do that. Move cards one slot to the left and smaller marginal effects like that that you could use to like build up bigger slots. But then we're adding more complexity and all of a sudden the game is mired down and taking longer. And I think that a lot of Space Space's design ethos was trying to capture this like it's trying to be a light game. And I think it succeeds at that. But to our taste, we wish that it had even more complexity and interesting decisions and leaned into that dice mixing mechanism that feels like it should create for interesting decisions when really it's just a outcome optimization tool. Well said. I don't know. That's kind of how I feel about this game. Yeah. Like, I don't know how much more I have to say about it. I guess we could compare it to Machi Koro a little bit. Do you? How? What experience do you have with Machi Koro? I think I've played Machi Koro all of like two times. Okay. So, and and it's been a long time ago. But like, I mean, so here's what I here's what I know about Machi Koro is that sure. it's a game that like essentially lays out in the exact same way you have slots i think it's one through 12 there or two it might be two so it's like even like a closer overlay of the settlers of Catan puzzle of dice yep. um and and you have a market of cards that you can buy that go onto the slots and if you roll the cards i think it's just it doesn't have the dual function um that yeah. space space has it's just like no matter what who rolls the dice everybody gets to activate their like main power of their cards um which i think leads to like even swingier sort of game states or results right because if you just get a nine and, and nines are hot in that game then you're probably going to be in like really good shape um so you know i think like my experience with space space made me appreciate it a little bit more than machi Koro, which i thought was like even more basis basic i think this is like clearly like an innovation and improvement to that system which is an older game um but you know i don't know that it gets so far away from some of the challenges that were present there to make it a game that really rises to the level that i'm enthusiastic about playing it more and more i think like the this idea of like taking that settlers of Catan dice puzzle and like streamlining it down right just taking that out of the game streamlining down to this you just have numbers that you get to improve like it feels like this is still a core game that could continue to be improved upon uh into something that like is truly a special game for someone like me and you like that we're really interested in exploring decision spaces i'm just not sure that this gets there yet i know yeah. there are other games in this space too that i haven't played um people in our discord have pointed to um i think dice forge as as sort of one that's similar to this um i think the new dice realms game might be approaching a similar type of design challenge. I know there's a Machi Koro Legacy, so there's like a lot of stuff out there that I haven't played yet. So I'm not saying that like that game doesn't exist. I just think like this one doesn't quite get there for me. Sure. I think that that's super fair. And I I feel like what we've sort of gotten to in this conversation, Jake, is like, yes, Space Space committed to what it wanted to be as it was positioned, right? It wanted to commit towards being a lighter game, but it didn't go far enough in that direction. It's not fast enough. And then where it's it's situated in this like uncanny value of it's not a 20 minute game with all of the zany wackiness. And it's it's not a 60 minute game with a lot of meaty depth. So it's kind of in this in between land that works really well as a gateway game. And I feel like for me, so my experience with Machi Koro, I bought it probably in 2014, I think. Um, I was living in Austin, Texas. Uh, we were, some friends were visiting from out of town. And we were really excited to have a new game. We're like, should we buy Dominion or should we buy Machi Koro? And sort of went back and forth, bought Machi Koro. 
Later on, I would buy Dominion and play it like 3,000 times. But <laughs> the game we bought was Machi Koro. And I, uh, we played it. And we're like, that's a game. It's, it's nice. And I think I played it five or six times. I actually still have it. I, I've thought about getting rid of it. And I probably should at some point. Um, but I think Machi Koro is a little bit more interactive in its card effects. I, if I remember right, like there's more cards that me having this down sort of taxes you. And it... Uh, I don't know. I'd much rather play Space Base than Machi Koro. I feel like I have more, my board becomes more interesting. It's more augmentable. It's more unique to me and my experience of the play. And it's less about tempo and the, the luck feels more mitigated here, but the basically where the game ended up, I think it could have gone further in either direction. It's cool. I'd always be, and if someone was like, do you want us to play Space Base? I'd say, yeah, let's play. Let's do it. I secretly in my head, I'd be thinking, I hope this goes fast. Um, Yeah. I wonder like, because we've only played this online. Like I'm kind of worried that like an in-person play of space base is like an hour affair. Yeah, I think it is, which is pretty long. I feel like that would just be like too long for what this is. Uh, You know, like 20 minutes feels a bit long (laughs) to me. So if you just like tack on like an extra 40 minutes there, I think like that could kind of be a, yeah, and I, I shouldn't like you know it's more fun to roll dice like actually in person so maybe like you, you get more benefits that make it worth it but I do think like some of the games that I've played too also just like end up in this space where it's like somebody's engine is like grinding to a halt right because yeah. they went for points early and they're just like doing nothing doing nothing doing nothing like getting one point here where like somebody else is like ramping up and it's just a matter of like are they gonna catch them in time yeah and that's kind of fun and exciting uh as like a you know tortoise versus the hare strategy and watching it play out online in 20 minutes is kind of fun and exciting especially if you're the person that's like the tortoise right that sure. hasn't but like i can just imagine like being the hare is sitting at a table and just like you're doing basically nothing for 30 minutes like it's that, rough. that would be my fear yeah and i think your fear would be more na- born out more often than we wish it would for sure yeah ah <sighs> i really really want to like it more than i do yeah well you gave it a 7.5 and i do like it i do like it i just yeah, yeah. at the end of the day being like a super simple easy to learn game like it's so accessible and like it makes me want to show this to people who are brand new to games especially if they have like some experience with Catan. and i think that's like a large group of there's there's that's like a a large segment like the board game interested population you know like people like come over and see my 100 game collection in my basement they're like do you have Catan? Yeah, I, yeah. I, like I feel like Space Space would be like an awesome game to like have for that situation. But, like I don't, but like I think you'd really like this. Totally. Just for that alone, and for being like a little more enjoyable than Machi Koro, it's like there's a ton of value in this game. Yeah. Um, and like it is just plain like fun at time, right? Like rolling yeah. dice, even if you're not making like amazingly challenging uh decisions on any given turn. Yeah. Like it's still like. Ooh, I like you got you rolled the 10 like and that's like gives me like six gold and income like that's just fun when it happens yep so i mean like easy accessible fun with a low low barrier to entry like that's great like yeah and i'm glad that games like this exist uh and you know and for that reason alone like i think it would have a value in my collection um even if like from this very hyper specific like decision space lens it leads to a lot of criticism. Yeah, totally. I think that that's a really good summation about the game. And I hope that this branch of games will continue to be iterated on and designed because I, I'm really fond of them. I just think that there's even more, like you were saying, that could go further that might make that an even more exciting experience. If this game played in 20 minutes, you show those friends, you play one game and they say, let's play again. I want to try this mm-hmm. other thing, you know? Like, I think it works even better if it's faster in a lot of those contexts. And there's little tweaks that could be made to just like ramp it up. I think, yeah, I want more games like this. I like games like this. Space Base hits the mark because it's the best I've seen it do. But I think it could be easily outclassed by a better design uh, uh, that takes a lot of the lessons from Space Base and says, wow, Space Space did so much right. And I think I can tweak these things and do something even better. Yeah. Knowing John John DeClaire, 
he designs a lot of games, iterates a lot of games, and I think is really good at this sort of augmentability. So maybe he will be the one himself to do that. And I'd be really excited to see what that game looks like. Maybe we could collaborate. Decision space base? <laughs> Decision space base. Oh my gosh. So good. Jake's just trying to find a way to make a game called to sneak decision space into a game and have it make sense. Decision space base. The space base game with where the real decisions are made. <laughs> <laughs> so good. All right. Uh, uh, well, Brendan, any, do you have any final thoughts here? I think uh, this was a nice short discussion about a simple, fun game. Um, I, yeah. I, think, I think I've kind of laid it out there, but I'll, I'll leave closing thoughts to you if you have any. I feel like, you know, we've really hit on a lot of what I'd like to hit on. I think that I'd love to hear from all of you, the listeners, what you think about Space Base. This is, a, I think, a little bit of a divisive game. We've heard from a lot of people in our Discord and elsewhere that they really, really dislike this game. We also heard from another group that they really enjoy this game and they're happy to see it hit the table. And I think that I've heard... The latter feedback from people who I know who play 18xx games, and I've heard the previous feedback from people who tend to play lighter games, and I think that it's really interesting seeing where players come down on if they are interested in playing Space Base or not, and I'd love to hear that conversation play out a little bit more. Sounds good. Well, as always, we just want to thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Decision Space. You can find uh, more conversation about this episode in our discord where we always uh like to talk about our episodes and you can find the link to that discord in the description of this podcast you can find brendan on twitter at burnside bh i'm on twitter at jake freed and the show is on twitter at decision spa uh we also have a gmail decision spa at gmail.com uh we have a patreon we would be grateful if you know if you want to join our crew and lastly but not least we always are hoping to see new reviews for decision space popping up that means a ton to us and is the best way really you can help us grow our show it's amazing i know you always as a podcast listener which you are uh hear people podcasters talking about reviews and saying it really does make a difference and we're here to say it really does make a difference to us. We got a ton of reviews early on in the lifespan of our show, which we appreciate so much. And they sort of jettisoned us into podcatchers as being recommended. And I have to be honest, it's been a little bit of a, a review drought lately, Jake. We had that really awesome one a couple of weeks ago. And since then, it's kind of been cricket. So if you listen to the show, you enjoy it, and you have a spare two minutes to throw five stars our way on whatever you listen to and maybe something funny about how... I have bad opinions about games or how I don't, whatever you'd like to say, we'll probably read it out on the show and would be so thrilled. And it really does help. So thank you for letting us make that small appeal. And yeah, we have amazing games coming up to cover. We have some really cool topical episodes on the horizon too. We might talk about mechanisms that make the game in an episode soon. So be on the lookout for that. All those games we mentioned, like I love cats, blood rage, Maybe even Dice Hospital, if I can get Jake excited Ooh, about it. I am in, I'm enjoying my first play of Dice Heck Hospital yeah. right now. Let's yeah. go. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Well, until next week, thank you as always to Hembry for our intro and outro music reach out. This has been Jake and Brendan signing off. Bye, y'all.